Well, I have a varied background. Uh, both of my parents were teachers, so um, we grew up and I grew up in Eastern South, well, when I was very young, I grew up on the Pine Ridge Reservation um, at Cooney Table, that's my maiden name. So I was born at Pine Ridge Indian Health Service, so my folks lived in, uh, on a ranch uh, for a couple years then. And then my dad was highly allergic to hay and was not going to be a good rancher because he was, he was miserable all the time. So my, one of my grandpas, Les, Grandpa Les said, maybe you better go to school because you're going to have to be inside. You can't, you can't do anything outside. And so I encouraged him to go on to college. So dad went to college at Northern and he graduated from there. And then uh, in the meantime, my mom would, would take evening classes every now and again because she started school at Northern as well. Um, that's actually, they met one another early on when uh, dad went to school at St. Elizabeth's and my mom went to school at Wakapala Day School. So they used to go to dances and stuff together. But, and so they both went to Northern Dad got his degree first in teaching, and then um, later on, then he, he uh, got a job in eastern South Dakota, Frankfurt, Brentford, Redfield area. And so we lived there, and then my mom finished her degree, and when she finished her degree, we went to, um, to California, Northern California, on the Indian relocation. And so we ended up in Northern California, and I always remember that I was in third grade, and we didn't, we didn't have to go to school for six months because we were way ahead of their system there. And then my mom homeschooled us while they were looking for positions. My mom got a job first at um, Sunkist Elementary School in Port Wyneme, California. And she told the district there, I'll come and teach for you if you can find a job for my husband. And so they found a job at E.O. Green Junior High School and so he taught history there, and he was their athletic, well, first he was their uh, coach. He did a uh, coaching um, um, basketball, and what else was he coaching in? Um, track. And then my dad was a boxer, too. He played golf. He was very athletic. So anyway, and so we lived there for a bit, and then finally they took the jobs, and we moved down to Southern California. So we stayed there for about seven years. Eventually my mom and dad got a divorce. Um, my mom wanted to come back to South Dakota and I wanted to come back too. I really miss my grandparents, especially my grandma. Um, I've always been, I, I, California was great and I, and I treasure that time there because I met so many different cultures, so many different peoples that I, 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 I think that's why I appreciate all different cultures now because I was exposed to it at an early age. Um, and. And I didn't think of, I didn't have those stereotypes of, 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 of not being able to do something because everybody did something out there, whatever race they were. So, um, and plus my parents were very supportive. So when, when they divorced, my dad stayed out there and he eventually remarried to a non-native lady. That's interesting. They're both native and they were married, but they split and they both married non-native people. Oh well. Anyway, so I have a half brother and half sister from my mom's second marriage, and and he came back with us he, uh, to South Dakota. So we lived in um, actually we lived in Rushville, Nebraska, and I went to school at a private school in Rapid City for my sophomore year. I went one year out in California uh, to a very large Eel Green High School, very large high school, um, and then um, came to a very small school. Uh, went to a private school in Rapids, St. Martin's Academy, my sophomore year, then transferred to Rushville High School, and that's where I graduated from. Well, went on to college, uh, st started at Northern because that's where my folks went. Thought I'd be alumni there, um, you know, where they went, where they went to school. And um, didn't like it because I didn't have my major. I wanted to major in anthropology. They only had sociology. So I transferred to, and, and I didn't like the weather. So what did I do? I transferred to Grand Forks, North Dakota, where it was worse, <laughs> and it was really cold. But I enjoyed um, the major there, and they were just starting to think about having a major in American Indian Studies. So my degree is in anthropology, my undergraduate degree, 
and my concentration is American Indian Studies. But the next year, and I feel fortunate that those of us students, that anthropology students, that wanted the AIS major didn't get it, but we had the concentration, but we helped design the AIS major. So I've been involved in curriculum development since I was young because I used to help my mom make things for her classroom. I used to help give her ideas about you know, what, what, what would work in teaching and all that. Because I grew up around that. So I always thought education and learning is fun. It's always been fun to me. That, that's really good. That's interesting because I didn't even know a lot of that story. Um, it's also good in recording these things to get the people's names. So what's the full name of your mom and your dad? My mother's name was Dorothy uh, Kadat, and then she married Lentz. She was Cooney, but she married a Lentz, Dorothy Lentz. And that was the name she held when she um, passed, when she went, crossed over. My dad's name is Alvin Earl Cooney, A.E. Cooney he goes by. And his dad is from, his name is Carl, his dad was from Pine Ridge. And my dad's mom was a fielder from Shine River. And my mom is from Standing Rock. And my, dad, my mom's dad is from Little Eagle, that community. And my mom's mom, Scholastica, Mad Bear, is her maiden name. She's from Wakapala. Actually, Mad Bear country out in the country. But uh, Who made the decision and how did they come about deciding where you would enroll at? My dad was enrolled at Cheyenne River. And when I was born at Pine Ridge, they almost automatically enrolled me there because my grandpa's from there. And that they had the last name Cooney. So they were going to automatically enroll me. My mom said in the hospital, "No, we don't want to. We don't want her enrolled here. If she's going to be enrolled any place, should we enroll at Standing Rock or else Cheyenne River?" And my dad's the one that wanted us, my sister and I, to be enrolled at Cheyenne River. Okay. So that's how we ended up being enrolled there. Okay. And then with your siblings and your half brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. where are all their names? Uh, Pamela Scholastica Lentz. She is no longer living, she's deceased, but she is enrolled, she was enrolled at Standing Rock. She was half, she was half, a uh, little more than half. Um, and my brother KJ, Kent Jerome, my mother was smoking cigarettes before she got pregnant with him and she smoked Kent cigarettes. So she named him Kent. Can you believe that? I, I just thought that was really gross. I said, Mom, that's really gross that you married me. You know, name your kid after a cigarette. She was really honest, though. KJ, we call him KJ Lentz. And he's enrolled at Standing Rock. Great. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. right. My dad's name was Gene, but he was named for a world heavyweight boxer, Gene Cooney. And then his middle name was Lindy for Charles Lindbergh. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, then my son's name is Gene after him. Yeah. And uh, But there are all kinds of little, like I'm John Henry, there's stories about that, too, though, so. <laughs> so it's kind of um, let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about kind of what we're interested in in terms of the research and what we're going to do and this is not going to really apply in your situation is we would like show the folks pictures and so for example if you saw that um, what would you call that kind of bird if you had to pick something I'd probably call it a, it's not, um, it's got white wings. It's kind of like a, um, it's not, a, it's not an eagle. Kind of looks like an eagle though. Yeah, it's, if you had, if you just need jerk reaction, what would you call it? Probably a hawk. Yeah, and it is a hawk. There isn't mm -hmm. any wrong or right answers yeah. though, but. And um, and I know the language isn't your background that much, but would you? Is there any way you would refer to that in the in Lakota? If you Chitang. okay, Chitang is hawk. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, so that's when you think of hawks, and this is the hard part because you, you're in this situation where I'm asking these questions. When you think of hawks, does does any story come to mind at all, or are there attributes about this that? come to mind when you think the hawk from a Lakota perspective? 
When I think of hawks, I think of red tail hawks. And do you notice on the on the that's how I can see that red tail right there? Right. And the reason why I think about that is because um, Crazy Horse wore hawk feathers in his hair. He didn't he didn't he wore one. He never wore eagle feathers. He always wore hawk. Because that was his, his gift. That was his helper was a hawk. And and a lot of people, you know, when they think of they think of great leaders like Crazy Horse and Sidney Bull and all that. They think of, well, they would have war bonnets and they'd have, you know, all kinds of eagle feathers on their war bonnets. But he was real humble and he only wore a hawk feather. So that's what I think of when I think of hawks. I think of Crazy Horse, first of all. And then I also think of, um, I see a lot of hawks. There are a lot of hawks in South Dakota. When you travel back, like from, from Spearfish and you go through Sturgis and you go by Bear Butte, and you go on the road on 34 going east, there are all kinds of hawks along that road. You can see them perched up in the, um, in the light poles and, and in the trees along the way. You see a lot of hawks on that road. And in fact, coming back by Isabel, I, I, when I was coming back from Standing Rock one time, there was a dead hawk on the, on the side of the road. So I stopped and, and I, I saw it. It was kind of moving, so I thought, oh, Maybe I can move it off the road if it's just injured. And I thought, that's kind of dumb. It'll probably scratch the heck out of me. But yeah, I was by myself, too. But I, I don't know why I did it. But anyway, I pulled over, and I, I went over to the end. And as I reached the hawk, he, he died right then. So I didn't get a chance to either you know, pull him off to you know, maybe give him a chance to live. But he died in front of me. And so I always carried tobacco with me. So I went and sprinkled tobacco on him. And then I got to thinking, well, I have relatives that use hawk feathers for their, for their outfits, for their dance costumes and like that. So maybe I'll take him. I, I, I asked his, actually, I asked his permission, can I take you? And, and I got the feeling, yeah, it's okay. So I left tobacco put tobacco on him, and then I, I, have, I always carry sage too. So I put sage in his mouth, open his mouth, put sage in it. And then I always carry trash bags in my car um, in case I run across stuff, porcupine or any sage or uh, any kind of medicine, because I collect a lot of medicines for, for doctoring. And so I put him in a garbage bag and put sage in there with him. And, when I got home, I put him right in the freezer so he wouldn't get messed up. But I kept him for about six months, and then I asked different relatives who needed hawk feathers, you know, who needs a hawk feather, some hawk feathers, and explained what I had. And then uh, one of my sons, one of Sam's sons, Dallas, he said, I, you know, I want to make a hawk bustle. I said, oh, okay, all right, I'll give you. And so I, I gave it to him, and so he, he made a bustle from that. But, the, you know, if I would have just left it there, you know, maybe somebody else would have come along and needed, you know, feathers too. Um, but a lot of us that, that utilize feathers and utilize things like porcupine quills and stuff like that, we're on the lookout for things when we travel. I, I, I always am anyway, because um, I don't go and kill anything like that. I just roadkill like that. So I, I um, I guess I'm more keen when I'm when I'm driving and looking for those things. When you uh, see a hawk, it, does that mean anything to you, or is there are there? To stories? some people, it's a connection. They have a like it's a spiritual helper. Like for Crazy Horse, it was one of his spiritual helpers. We call them totems, or you know, guides, spirit guides, uh, that they have a, a spiritual connection to that animal or that bird or whatever it is. And so when I see that, I always put tobacco out. When I see any kind of winged animal, whether it be a hawk, whether it be an eagle, um, and I don't know too much about falcons, but um, I know that they're swift, they seem like they go swifter and they're a little bit smaller than hawks, I think. Anyway, um, when I see them, I always offer tobacco, put it out the window and, and give thanks for the winged. Um, mainly because I associate birds of carrying our prayers to the Creator, and especially the eagle who flies the highest. 
you know, he flies so high that you can't see him anymore. He flies so high. All right, very good. Here's another image in it. What would you identify that as well, being? Eagle. Okay. And is there any term in Lakota or any other tribal language that you would refer that to? Well, Wambli is eagle. Um, Peshwa, okay. Wambli, Peshwa. Okay. I don't know. Okay. That's bald. Okay. And um, in the eagle, what is that? Make you? How does that make you feel? Are there stories about the eagles? That uh, I just said that you know it carries our prayers to the Creator. Uh, we use a lot of eagle feathers for lots of things uh, in our naming ceremonies. Like we'll use the men will use the feathers and put them on medicine wheels for for males. And then the underside here, if you look on the under here, this fluff part, this white, that's the part that we use. Women use that that for our medicine wheels for naming and for honoring. So, but that's the way the Lakota people believe. There are other tribal groups that believe that it's okay for women to wear feathers. But for us, we're, we're taught that we wear plumes. The women wear plumes, men wear feathers. Um, and which is kind of ironic because some of the old photographs that you see, um, the women in their costumes, they used to have their buckskin dresses or their cloth dresses on. They'd wear a headband and they'd have one feather going up. And I always thought that was kind of interesting that that uh, nowadays they don't, we don't see a lot of Lakota women wearing feathers. I mean, once in a while you will, but not not as much. You see a lot of plumes they're wearing, but not feathers. But I also think of uh, so I think of naming and I think of ceremony. I think of when our men Sundance uh, on their sage head gear. They'll oftentimes uh, have two feathers going up, and they're spike feathers, tail feathers, or else they'll have, um, or else they'll hang one from the back and just have it hanging down from their um, from their sage um, headpiece. So I I think of many ceremony when I see eagle feathers, and I think that our ancestors might be a little perturbed with us. Because back in the day, we didn't put eagle feathers, uh, like we, we well, we put eagle feathers on our, our heads, like in, in our headdresses, war bonnets, they call them war bonnets. Um, we put them on our wapegnaka as our honor pieces that made out of quilled pieces that we'd hang fe uh, eagle feathers off of there. Men wore them. And then they would also, um, they would uh, use feathers, um, like attach them to shields, or attach them to their war shirts, their overlay, their war shirts. But they would not wear them on their butts for a bustle, for a dance bustle. So that's a that's a real new phenomenon. What they usually used for their bustles in the back, uh, traditional dancers would either use hawk feathers, owl feathers, or um, turkey feathers. And turkey was probably the preferred animal to make big bustles out of. But nowadays it seems like everybody has a an eagle feather bustle. Great. When you, you know, spotted eagle mm -hmm. is, is, what is a spotted eagle? Is it, is it an actual eagle or mm -hmm. is it a hawk or well, is it I, fictitious? I think it's a, it's a spotted eagle is a American eagle. Is that what they call them? Uh, spotted tail eagle, spotted eagle. I don't know. The way I was taught, it's a, it's a real eagle and it's, and it's uh and it has, if you look at the feather, it has like white spots on the feather. They're real pretty. Okay. And that, we use a lot of those in, in ceremony too. Okay, so it's probably a, a golden or a... Go, that's what they call them, golden, yeah. golden eagle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Spotted eagle is a golden eagle. All right. Okay, here's another bird for you. You probably already figured this one out. Um, <laughs> Would you know what that was if you saw it? In you know, if I if I saw it and just saw the part there, I think, well, that's a big owl. <laughs> well, the yeah. claws are huge. Uh -huh. and, but then, when you look at it here, no, it doesn't look like an owl there. Mm -hmm. So this is probably a falcon. But I, you know, I don't really know too much about falcons. And from what I understand, and and. Like, I don't have much knowledge of them. And I'm sure they're around. 
And I'm thinking that maybe I'm seeing falcons when they're flying, and they, I'm thinking that they're hawks, you know. Like a sparrow hawk or something yeah. like that, because they're just a smaller. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Right. Because aren't, weren't falcons endangered? Yes, they were. Yeah. They uh -huh. were, yeah. Because of poison six, or Yeah, something? DDT, yeah. The, the pesticide. Uh -huh. And then they, they're actually indigenous. They're, they're everywhere they're in the world over. except uh -huh. for the Antarctic and then like Madagascar. But they're mm -hmm. the most adaptable Widespread. predatory. Yeah. And they're definitely in this area where mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So, um, and in, and I've just kind of, we're just giving you a little background. The, the falcon is more interesting to some travel communities than it is. For where I grew up, falcons are more talked about. Mm. And so there's more stories. And there's actually specific phrases for that's a peregrine falcon. So they have a very specific name for, for that particular bird and stories that are associated with that. Mm. So um, let, let's just kind of step back. And, if, and again, it's difficult. Uh, what we're going to do is actually have some people in a panel to see if they can't get each other thinking about some stories. Mm -hmm. But... For falcons? I mean, well, for, for birds in general. Oh, we're just going to mm -hmm. say birds in general. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned some things already about uh, what the eagle connotes or what it mm -hmm. what it kind of means. Uh, as we're sitting here, do, do any stories about any kind of birds come to mind? Any children's stories or uh, things about the attributes of, of birds? Uh, and I know it's hard once you put somebody on the spot when so I, tell when me a bird story. Yeah, when I think of birds, so I think of, you know, I think of associated with humans. I know that's weird, but, uh, and not so much like oral traditional stories and stuff, but more like today, I think of like the bluebird. I don't know if someone calls it the bluebird of happiness, but the bluebird, um, Mom Nellie Tubles, her Lakota name was Bluebird Woman. And the reason why they, she said they named her that was because um, that's one of the few birds that stays around in the wintertime, I guess. Uh, it can adapt to real cold environments. And so they looked upon her as being a very strong woman like the bluebird. Plus, she sang beautifully like the bluebird. So that's why they named her that, bluebird woman. Galatoli, I think it is. Bluebird woman. So when I think of birds and winged, I associate them with either people or ceremony okay. automatically. Okay. How about owls? What what comes to mind when you think of owls? I love owls. A lot of people get nervous about owls because of the they say that oh it's impending death. They're they're giving you a warning of that somebody's gonna die. Um the great white owl was a spirit helper for Grandpa Fool's Crow. And when he'd have his ceremony, his Luwampi or Yuwipi ceremonies, the great white owl would come inside and would flap around and fly around in the, in the ceremony, doctoring people. That was one of his spirit helpers. So you could feel its wings brushing past you. It felt good. You could, it felt wind and it smelled good. You know, it felt like a bird. And, it, and, it, and but it made you feel, it made me feel good anyway. And, and so when I think of the owl, then I have positive, you know, I think about the white owl and grandpa. But like I said, some people um, think of, and how grandpa explained it to us, to me, is that wouldn't, he, he liked to be, get um, warnings of things. It's, um, he said, that's what the owl is doing. It's giving you a warning of something that's going to happen. And oftentimes it is something to prepare you for a death or something that's negative that's going to happen. But it's, it's, a, it's giving you a, a heads up, so to speak, so that you can prepare yourself for, it, for what's going to happen. Okay. And to be aware of that and, 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 to watch, and also to watch yourself. Be careful because it might be you and not somebody else, you know, to take care of yourself. Um, and let's, we'll just, I'm just going to name some birds, and if, if something triggers, then you can talk about it. And I have one of my, one of my sisters, my Meshke, uh, one of my sister friends, um, her, Sam named her Owl Woman. Owl Woman? Because, Pihangwe. Because if you think of that, Pihang, that's our word for owl. 
Yeah. Uh -huh. That's how it sounds. That's the sound it makes. What they call it? Omnomatopoeia? Oh, oh I see. Uh, where, where that the sound. The word the, and the sound are the, the same. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That is the word for owl. Okay. Well, I I think of that too a positive because that's her name and Sam named her that. Owls always come around her, no matter where we're at. Well, we're at a place visiting. We're up in the Black Hills, uh, touristing around, having fun. Owl will be sitting there on a tree next to us if she's there. During the day. Right. And they're not really around during the day, are they? No, they aren't. What, what um, how about um, doves or small birds? Uh, does that strike any... And I know it's hard when you, I'm just asking you to mm -hmm. tell me a story about this or that, but or uh, magpies. I've magpies always... remind me of because they make noise. Right. They kind of they're kind of loud. Uh, magpies. The story my grandma told me about that is that when you hear magpies and they're kind of yakking at you, he said they're reminding you that you better get home. when you get home you better put some food on because you're going to have visitors and they're gonna and they're gonna. Um, you're going to have to feed people. So whenever we'd hear magpies or have them come around, she, she would remind me, okay, when we get home, let's start cooking. And I knew that from the magpies. That was their, their uh, warning to us to, to be prepared for visitors. How about any taboos with birds, like not to touch them or eat them, certain types of birds? Does that sound? Does that they anything? don't eat eagles. Okay. They don't eat hawks. I don't think we eat any birds. All we eat, we eat um, prairie chickens. Okay. That's a bird, huh? Yeah. We eat them. I don't think, let's see, what other birds do we eat? Chicken. I don't know, I think Plains Indians are pretty particular. Eat owls. They, don't, they don't much care for fish. They don't care we for We don't eat know. owls. Yeah. I don't think we eat hardly any birds. Any? Certainly we don't eat sparrows and meadow larks and all them. They're too little. Right. Why do you want to eat them? Right. Or things. Right. <laughs> and then part of what um, the biologists are interested in is why feathers are used in regalia. Mm -hmm. You know, so you choose to answer it as if you're talking to a little kid or to whoever. You know, some little kid asked you, why, why are there feathers? Well, obviously, we would use eagle feathers because that they, they carry our prayers. So why not put something on your body that's in, especially on your head, in your hair that's gonna transmit those prayers to the Creator. Um, in terms of other things, uh, if, if, if you have a helper that's an owl, like Grandpa Fool's Girl made owl bustles because that was his helper. So that's what he wore. And then, so he would make, he made Sam an owl bustle one time. But Sam was was teased by other people because nobody wanted to dance with him because it, because it was an owl bustle. I said, "Ah, hey, get away from me! I'm kind of you make me nervous." But we we just thought it was funny. Um, but that connection between uh, feathers and regalia again ties to you know either your spirit helper or it's it's uh, it's something that that can help carry your prayers or or and and they're beautiful, they're colorful, they look nice. They, uh, and, and when you dance, like there's a dance called the eagle dance. When you dance, you're mimicking the eagle. So obviously, you know, you would want to be light uh, on your feet and you would want to, you know, you would want the wings to, to go and be light as a feather, so to speak. So. How about just generally describing from your understanding and perspective, if you compare Western society and their attitudes about animals, and the way Native culture looks at animals. I mean, how do you react to that? I mean, what, how do you think that that they're different? I mean, obviously, you and I would yeah, they're, have our well, they're, discussions they're about both, it. But I want they're to hear both what you living think. beings. You know, they're they're equal to us. They're not better. They're not worse. They're equal. Um, all things that live on Mother Earth, humans, um, and animals, and even though I don't particularly like snakes and in some insects and so forth, they're, they're my equal. Um, and I'm scared of some of them, but I also know that they have a reason for being on Mother Earth. Um, the Creator, or 
they were created to be part of our environment. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. And so, um, part of the the ecosystem, part of their part of their you know environment, has to do with symbiosis, symbiotic kinds of things. You know, helps feed. They say in our oral tradition that Wakia made um, um, made the insects so that the birds would have something to eat. You know, and so we have um, we have that concept of of knowing that. Some of our animals give up their lives so that we can survive, so we can live. But we also give thanks to those animals that give up their lives so that we can survive. And we, we don't take that for granted. We, we acknowledge their spirit of that animal and know that they are um, as valuable as we are. And, it, and what would be your interpretation of Western Judeo-Christians' views towards animals then? I think that a lot of them think that they're of a higher order. Humans are a higher order, and uh, animals and birds and whatnot are less lesser than, from what I understand. Right. Okay. I think that's kind of changing, though. Believe it or not, I think many non-native people are realizing that that they they're fooling themselves when they they think that they that they're they're all it and that they're the only things that can think. They're finding, we're finding more about whale behavior and dolphins and other kinds of um, animals that have um, feelings, emotional feelings, and so forth. So, Yeah, I tend to agree with him because you have endangered species. And there's a, real, a recent study that talked about the complex language that prairie dogs have. They, can, they have okay. how loud they talk to each other and yeah, mm -hmm. how they communicate with each other, much more yeah. complicated than... Previously thought yeah. from a Western tradition. Yeah, they're not just making noise. Right, yeah. right. They're they're communicating. And native cultures seem to have been aware of that or comfortable with that perception more so than let's say the scientific tradition was for a long time in terms of you know what are animals doing and are, are they so um, um, let's see forgot my next question the what about other just just other animals. And so I'll mention some animals and what kinds of thoughts do you have about them? For example, turtles. What, what do you think of when you think of turtles? Automatically, first comes to mind long life. Turtles have a long time. They live for over 100 years, some of them. Um, I think of um, the women's puberty ceremony in which for the Lakota people, um, a young girl that is uh, coming of age from girlhood to womanhood will take a bite out of a beating heart of a turtle so that she will have a long life like the turtle. Um, and if you, if you kill a turtle, its heart will beat, it will continue to beat for a while. Even though it's dead, it will, the heart still keeps beating. And so our people recognize that kind of behavior they look at the animals, they look at the different things and realize that that's, that's what they do. So, so by taking a bite out of that heart, then, then you're saying that, that you're recognizing that I want to be like that turtle. I want to live long like that turtle so that my, my heart will keep beating for a long time in, on Mother Earth. Okay. How, about, how about just horses? And there's kind of a well, you, you tell me, what, when you think of horses, what's the relationship, I guess? When I think of horses, I think of Grandpa Fool's Crow's relationship with horse. He had a beautiful uh, ceremony that he did called Horse Dance. He had that real connection with, um, and was able to communicate with horses. Um, he loved horses. And when he sang this song to the, all the directions, I've even seen the horses dance. He, he put him in a big corral, and he sat and he put, brought his chair out, his powwow chair, he put it in the middle of that corral, that pole barn corral, put it in there, and he sang that song. He didn't have a drum or anything, but he just sang, and and just the beat of how, how I could just hear it. And those horses, not all of them, but most of them, 
dancing around him in that corral. Um, That's what I think of. Right. But horses are very powerful. They're kind of scary, too. They're big. But horses love me. Whenever I go into, like, um, out in the country, we have a lot of horses out out on the range and stuff. And if... uh, and if I and my son has this too. Uh, if we talk to them, uh, they'll come. I say, "Come here!" I will holler at them. "Come, come here! Come here!" Ooh, uh, come here! That means come here. And so they'll they'll come over and they'll and they'll come up to me and they'll nudge me on my back because they know I'm kind of half scared of them. <laughs> they do. Right. So they'll so they'll tease me tease like you. that. Right. You bet. But my, my youngest son, Dawson, he's, um, we were at um, a cemetery. Of, um, we took my, my youngest sister and uh, my younger sister and her daughter to, to visit the grave of my mom and my sister this last summer. And there were a bunch of horses um, in the pasture next to the cemetery beyond the fence. There's a fence around it. And so we walked over there and we, so, so that they can visit, you know, have, have their prayers in private. We walked over by the horses, and the horses weren't next to the fence. They were like oh, maybe 20 feet in into the pasture. And Dawson, he's kind of crazy sometimes, but but he was he started um, singing that horse dance song that Grandpa sings. He started singing that. I don't know what made him do it, but he started singing it, and those horses, their ears went up, and they all came over to him. They just came right to him and. And, uh, and we're going like that and wanting him to touch them. How about so I think people can have connections to different animals and they have that rapport with animals. Uh, probably what's most commonly talked about is the relationship with the buffalo. So what's your reaction when I say, what do you think of the buffalo? Well, that's our, that's our sustenance. That's our life force. That's... We are the Buffalo people. We are the Buffalo Nation. The Oyate. And, and that's the female term for Buffalo. So we are matrilineal. You know, we, are, we are from a people that recognizes that, that the woman is, is very important in, in our society. So even our creation, our old long ago stories, refer to, to our, our people as the, the Oyate, not the Tatanka Oyate which is the male term for buffalo, the teoyate. And so that means, because language is a real indicator of um, how old something is. Those are those old jawbreaker words. And that's just, that's just so clear, that example. The buffalo gives of itself so that we may live as well. Uh, we believe that if, the, if there are no more buffalo, then there are no more Lakota. We, all, we, we won't be a, anymore if they're gone. And what was frightening is we almost were gone. We almost, there were only, what, 200, 400 buffalo left in the Northern Plains. So we were almost decimated. We were almost dead as Lakota Nation. But now we're thriving again because we have buffalo again. All the tribes have buffalo. And we, we are, we're being renewed. We, Regeneration, you know, new, new, new life because of the buffalo we have now. There are lots of stories about buffaloes uh, and stories like the four leggeds and the two leggeds and the winged. When I say that, is there a story that comes to mind that you would just tell about, I don't know, races or, or well, the, the difference between race, them? Or, the Black Hills. Yeah, just, just, just give us an example of a story that. do that one if you wanted to or the racetrack or, or um, yeah. trying to and everybody tells that one um, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell a story about um, and it's not really a long story but it's it's an association that Sitting Bull has with the monarch um, butterfly you know, a lot of people, you know, they think that they, they want to have power of the eagle and the bear, you know, all these big animals because they're very strong and courageous and all that. Well, one of um, Sitting Bull's 
spirit helpers was a monarch buffalo or a monarch butterfly. And when he would, when he would, wherever he was praying or whether, wherever uh, he would go to fast or to, you know, ceremony, wherever it was, they would come around. And monarch buffalo, bu I keep saying buffalo, monarch um, butterflies aren't around all the time. They're only, you know, certain times, certain seasons, certain times of the year. But they would be around him and they would show themselves to him. But that, you know, when people think about that, they think, oh, butterfly, that's not so macho, you know. But again, you know, our, our belief, uh, Lakota belief system is that even in the smallest insects, ants and, and um, dragonflies and, and all those things, you know, there, there's power in those things as well. Not just, not just big things. Right. You know, it's interesting because Rosalie talked about dragonflies. She has a particular interest in dragonflies, and they're very agile. Switch them. You know, they can, they can, and that she sees that more often in in regalia. So it, it used to be a lot on shields and stuff and, back uh, in the day, because right. that's the attributes that men, warriors would want to have. Right. Know, swiftness. And what? I, I, yeah, and you mentioned at ants. What's the Ants, that's a, a lot of Native cultures have mm -hmm. ideas about Stories, ants. Yeah. What, what, is, what do you think ants reflect then? I mean, what do they well, When I think of ants, though, I think of, of them pushing up um, beads and stuff from anthills, from graves. That's what comes to my mind first wow. when I think of ants. But, but that's good, too, because they're, they're cleaning things. They're cleaning things that, that were once affiliated with somebody that was alive. And so they're they're bringing those gifts up to the surface okay. for people to use. Okay. So if you want to get really old beads and stuff, you look at those real old ant hills. And I mean, if you're not afraid of getting bit by ants, <laughs> and get get them like that because they're they'll they're gifts from the ant nation. Okay. Is there is there any particular animals or maybe plants and stuff that are associated with fertility from a Lakota perspective? Is there any? The, the, the well, the buffalo, buffalo is fertility. Okay. Uh, when we at our Sundance ceremonies, when we have um, fecundity and long life and buffalo, we have uh, cutouts, rawhide cutouts that are hanging on the cottonwood tree, the Sundance tree, and one will be a cutout of a man, and the other one will be a buffalo, and so both of those, there are signs of fertility. Okay. Um, you know, more, more regeneration, more fecundity, is that what they call it? More right. people, population growth. Yeah. And Early. so they are a visual reminder when those sun dancers, when they're looking at that tree and looking up and praying towards the sun, they see those cutouts up there and they think, you know, that's why they're there. They're there to pray for the people. They're there to pray so that the people may live. Okay. How about bears? Is what comes to mind when you think of bears? Well, bears are, for one thing, we don't eat bear. Bear is a food taboo for us as Lakota people. Because if you look at a bear from a distance when it stands up, it looks like a man from a distance. And I, I don't know if any of you have ever done butchering a bear, but they look they look like men. They're really creepy. That kind of makes me creeped out a little bit. But bears are, are um, in Lakota belief, um, the bears have a knowledge that we had a society known as the Bear Dreamers. Bears had a lot of knowledge about herbal remedies. In our long ago stories, our oral tradition, uh, the bears were the ones that, that listened. They have really good listening skills. And so they, we tell our young people to be like the bear, to listen. To use your ears more than your mouth and so that's what the bear tells us and so um, the bear then is matho but but in sacred language it's hunupa um, too upright too legged that way but in non-sacred language it's matho okay. but blue claw I think or blue something but um, 
but the bears, I, I feel really close to bears because uh, one of my great 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 grandfather's name was Mad Bear, and he was a very strong, good good man. Good stories about him, and and he was, um, and so the the what I know about the bear is that you know it, it positive, and so our bear dreamers then those are the ones that had the knowledge of uh, of herbal remedies. So they knew a lot of medicines. So if somebody today says that they're a bear dreamer and they dream of the bear, then what they're kind of saying is, I, I, I've been giving the gift of a lot of different herbal remedies to help the people. All right. And you'd mentioned this idea about kind of diminutive animals, you know, that they, whether it's a monarch or when we talked, to, I mentioned the dragonfly. Mm -hmm. what, what about, just to kind of round out the animal conversation, um, any ideas about mice or uh, other types of beetles or, I mean, obviously spiders probably. Mm -hmm. um, any stories about those animals that come to, come to mind? Or, or just feelings um, that you have about them? There are stories about mice, like, like to tell kids, you know, those kind of stories about how they, how they uh, hide things and how they like to... Um, like the one story where the mice is running through the buffalo skull, you know, and so there, you know, those are kid stories, but, but the um, ichthomi or a spider, you know, that a lot of people think that ichthomi is 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 you know they think of the trickster when they think of the spider, but spider can also be medicine. We have brown spiders and gray spider, different kinds of spiders, but we have some of our medicine people, our healers have a spider medicine in which they can doctor people. One of my nieces has brown spider medicine. And so if you go into one of her sweat lodges, like I have, my knees are always hurting. So when I sit with my legs out and in her sweat, sweat lodges, that spider will come crawling over my, and doctor my knees. Cause that, it, well, doctor where you're hurt. So. It feels good too. It kind of tickles like, but if you're scared of spiders, it creeps you out probably. But I'm not scared of spiders, okay. because for one thing, I know that that spider is doctoring me. It's okay. trying to help me. Right. So I I don't kill spiders, and but if there's like a some of those that hop that are real dangerous, you know, some of them are are poisonous kind of. If I see some of those, um, she told me that it's okay if I kill it. But I have to say this, Wakia made me do this. She said, so if you kill a spider, say Wakia made me do it. So that permission made mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, but I, otherwise I don't, I try not to. I try to take them out and put them on a paper and take them outside. Okay. Well, and I know you and I both have a class coming up and I wanted to guess if he had thoughts or questions in a minute, but the last thing I wanted to ask and then we'll see if Gus has a question is, is there any observations or tips about doing oral histories or suggestions that you might have for us as we try to do this kind of thing or or any reflections on the idea of doing this you know is this do you think this is a good idea to try to record these stories and perceptions or is there things that we should be concerned about uh, well the, i guess the, what i what what are you going to do with them are you going to make a book or are you going to yeah we're going to do um the Fish and Game folks are going to do an educational brochure mm -hmm. that they'll use at their outreach centers and stuff. Okay. And it will have, like, um, Lakota descriptions of animals and possibly stories with them. Mm -hmm. And so eventually it could get kind of like, I think, what you do in your ethnobotany where you have the English phrase, mm -hmm. scientific, scientific phrase. Mm -hmm. So it, it can go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, there's also interest in... Uh, this looking at regalia and what is these the why is it positioned there what does it mean why did they select that animal mm -hmm. and to get a better better eth uh, ethnobiological sense mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff you could probably find lots of stuff if you talk to dancers then you know people that actually use the regalia like one of the just for an example the, the feather, when they wear their feathers in the front like that, I don't know if you've seen some of them, that, that the feathers are like in the front. Kind of cover their eyes. Yeah, yeah, back in the day, now this is what Grandpa told me, 
uh, those are the individuals that would be the eapaha. When you see that feathers like that, those are the ones that you, if you want somebody to, to talk for you or speak for you, to have a giveaway or to, to be an announcer, to, to announce your, your particular ceremony, what you want to do. They were the one, the reason why they wear their feathers like that is because they are saying, I can do that. I will, I will do that if you, if you choose me to, to do that. And, and so, but I don't see a lot of those young kids that wear them like that. I don't think they know that. I know that, yeah. I don't think they have that, that old knowledge. Knowing the responsibility yeah. associated with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like even uh, some of the paint, you know, that people, some of their young people wear. And I actually have been to traditional powers in which elders have, have pulled young people aside and had them come up to the mic and say, tell us about your paint. Tell us about your regalia. And sometimes they can't. Right. And if they can't, then they look to their grandparents. And if they can't, it's really embarrassing. But oftentimes there will be an elder up there that will stand up and say, this is what my teachings are regarding this. This is how I was taught about this, and then they'll share that with the people. Sure, sure. That's a good. That's a good, very good point. I had thought, thought more of talking about to elders, but I hadn't thought about talking to the dancers to well, know what the their ones story. That are wearing them. <laughs> yeah, what their story is. Yeah. All right, Gus. Did you have any questions or any thoughts? Or? But then, I just want to say with something about ikdomi though. Ikdomi can be also protection, like. When our, on our baby carriers and the designs that we put on our on 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 the postan, the baby you know carriers are oftentimes spider designs, and so um, wakia and spider are very uh, sometimes opposing forces, but they also understand the relationship that they have with one another, and so. Uh, the spider is the protection. So spider can be protection, too. Okay. I like that idea. Yeah, I, yeah, I hadn't heard that. That's good, though. I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got On the note of regalia, I've noticed in my research how they use a variety of feathers in peyote fans, mm -hmm. and being more of a, a, like more of a or, modern yeah. practice. But I have seen falcon feathers, owl feathers, hawk feathers all in the same fan. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any explanation for it, just a you know, curiosity. You know who, who might be able to answer that? Is Sandor, because he belongs to the Native American Church. Actually, I don't know if you know that, but Sandor is the international president now of the Native American Church. I saw that on the, on the yeah. internet, yeah. And he's, actually, he's going to come and talk to my American Indian philosophy class on the 13th, Tuesday the 13th. Oh, is that right? So if he's on campus that day, you might you want to visit with him. With yeah, that's a good you idea. You can visit with him. Yeah. I, you know, I can guess why all the, the multicolored, you know, but he would be the person that you might ask about that. What's your speculation then? I'm just thinking that it's um, just like um, the rainbow colors and all the colors that they have, you know, they, they, they talk about all the races, they talk about all the different beliefs they talk about, um, you know, just a variety of inclusiveness in their in their belief system, uh, you know, because they also, you know, they believe in Jesus Christ, they believe in, you know, the tribal ways. So that's that's why I would think that they would want a whole variety of feathers in there. The inclusion of all nations. Yeah, or yeah, something. that's that's the way I would think. But I, it may be way off after you ask him. But that's what I would guess. Okay. The other thing I found fascinating was in petroglyphs and hieroglyphs and I don't know if we use that rock right. art. Rock art and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot of bird symbology. And mm -hmm. a, when you see a, a bird, say carved into a rock or in a winter count, what does that have a significance there, or would you have to know the story? I don't know. What's your reaction to Thunderbird? Then I mean, from a look, because Thunderbird is different other places. Is that actually referenced in Lakota, mm -hmm. or is that okay? Mm -hmm. What What does that mean to you? Thunderbird is a is a, is Wakia, but you know that's that is Thunderbird is the representation of Wakia, thunder and lightning. 
comes into Thunderbird. That's how you see him. And so, um, and so when I when I see, uh, like Lane Deer, for example, will talk about um, the flash of, you know, the the eyes of the of the Thunderbird. His eyes are the are the lightning, and his mouth, his sound that he makes is the thunder. So. Is the Thunderbird then uh, an embodiment of a nature force, or is it like Iktomi that's a kind of a character? Do you, mm. do you see what I mean? It's a it's nature force. It's the the power of thunder and lightning in in a bird, in a visible bird. Because you wouldn't have like Iktomi goes and gets married. You don't have like Thunderbird goes and gets married. Do you see what I'm saying? It isn't um, usually stories like that. I have that. not heard anything about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I think of Thunderbird association with more with spiritual power and, and omnipotence and real 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 strong. Kind of scary too. Right. <laughs> real forceful. You know. Loud. How about booming? You know, I think in one of our older texts that we used, it talked about this relationship with plants and animals, that the plants were provided medicine, the animals were representing disease or something like that. It's a southeastern hmm. story. Hmm. Is there any, does that bring a bell at all, anything about plants possessing power in animals or some conflict between animals and plants? Does that sound consistent? Yeah. I don't. I don't see the conflict. I I see more of a, like I said, symbiotic, symbiotic relationship. Right. Like the like the, like Wakia, for example. We believe Wakia made the plants too, and the insects. Right. So Wakia is associated with the plants, um, for healing, for food, um, but also as a covering of Maka, you know, in our oral history. So that so that Maka won't be naked, so that she will be clothed. Right. There's an Eastern tradition that talks about in their oral history of um, conflicts between humans and animals, and that uh, plants came to the assistance of humans in that conflict to help with disease and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's a, it's an interesting kind of. Mm -hmm. but I didn't. I always wondered if there were, if there would. I've never heard that kind of attitude. In the plains, or you know, in the in the plateau area, about there might be. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Right. Who well, knows? But you know, because because uh, different medicine people have different gifts and different stories with things, and so there might be a story out there. Right. The the uh, Diné Navajo tradition has. I was down there a long time ago in the summer for fellowship, and they taught. They have stories about men and women not getting along. And that the men all left. They went across a big stream, and they lived apart for a while. But it it, it was very dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And so finally, these two that were in love swam across the river and were so together could, again. Yeah. And everyone watched this happen, and they realized that they couldn't be separated anymore. But it was an interesting story to talk about conflict between, you know, if you have a problem with your. Mm -hmm spouse or something or your sibling or something and they would tell this story mm -hmm. and I thought it was interesting because unlike you know a series of rules that you've got you know don't kill don't do this mm -hmm. don't do that rather than say that say well you, you don't you have a problem with your wife let me tell you this story mm -hmm. you know and that's what our that's what our elk dreamers do those that are associated with the elk they are the ones that deal with love and relationships and counseling and keeping the family in harmonious way sure. harmony those that have the medicine elk medicine well good that's another one with elk and that's another one